What's up, guys? Welcome to another edition of the Fitness Experiment Podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in. This week, we bring you part two of fitness myths. So last week, Jesse and I talked about a lot of these popular misconceptions that exist in the health and fitness community. This week is part two. So many things came up that Jesse and I just kept going and going and going. For a couple hours, we ended up having to split this into two parts. If you didn't hear last week's episode yet, that's okay. You're not going to miss out on anything if you don't listen to that before this podcast. So it's not like we explained some necessary details in the last one. But I would say that you are kind of missing out if you haven't listened to that one yet. But listen to this one and then go back to that first one because we had a ton of awesome feedback on that last one. The people loved it. And why not? Why couldn't you? There's a lot of interesting stuff. These myths that we hear over and over and over again, many of them just are not true. So today, this week, we're going to talk about this belief that CrossFit is terrible for the body. We hear this all the time. We dig into why being quote unquote bulky does not necessarily mean that you actually fatigue faster. So just think of the common example, CrossFit athlete games athlete competing in marathon triathlon that kind of thing against people who have a much different body type we'll talk about the if it fits your macros diet the truth on fasted cardio why the term metabolism is so misused we talk about lactic acid how this is often misused and so many more things so i hope you guys enjoy this one another awesome one again we're gonna have to come back to these myths again because there's so many and they're so interesting But enjoy this one. Please give us a five-star review. Share this with friends and family so that we can keep bringing this content to you. Thanks, guys. Enjoy it. We're back. Back again. (laughs) Ran out of time. Yeah. This is a long episode. It's a good one, though. Lots of good stuff to talk about. Yeah. We're going to kind of keep it going on the physical side of things, the more of the fitness side of things. And yeah, one thing that always comes up is uh, CrossFit's bad for you. Yeah, or CrossFit is terrible for the body. Mm -hmm. I used to hear this one all the time. I even used to think this myself. Guilty before I started CrossFit, which wasn't that long ago. What's your opinion on this? Uh, Again, it's like all these myths that we've talked about so far just comes from a point of ignorance. It's, uh, It's an opinion that's formed on no information or research it's solely based on opinion and what you heard from your buddy at the gym in most cases which was my case yeah one thing that i always think of when this comes up crossfit is terrible for the body i've realized that you could make this exact same argument for any competitive sport Mm -hmm. i've realized this i don't know where the argument originates from I assume it's just because people get injured doing CrossFit. Well, hey, (laughs) if you're doing any sports, there's a risk for injury. Right. And like I said, you could make this, if we talk about like body mechanics, you could make this argument for any sports. I brought this up in one of our podcasts. It might have even been one of the very first ones. But I said, this idea of CrossFit is bad for the body. I said, if we look at hockey because that's what my experience is in, you could make that exact same argument for hockey. So I talked about how, think about how much of their early life a hockey player spends one bent over. So this can put some strain on the low back. It's definitely going to tighten up your hip flexors, tighten up your hip flexors. You're going to tighten up a whole whack of other things. And then if you think of, shooting either left or right that means you're essentially your body is essentially twisted for again like a huge majority of your life and these things when you accumulate this time like if you only play hockey for a few years these things aren't going to have an effect but i can tell you this from personal experience from playing hockey with hundreds thousands of other players they'll tell you the exact same thing you accumulate these little minor nagging injuries and i guarantee that most of these are from developing imbalances Mm -hmm. from either leaning forwards with you know left arm left shoulder left hip or the other way around right shoulder right arm right hip etc 
from being bent over. So from shortening your hip flexors, all these different things, these accumulate over time. When you think of thousands of hours, thousands of reps, I guarantee that these lead to eventual injuries, but no one says hockey is terrible for your body. I don't think. No, yeah. Stay with hockey. What if we look at concussion, head injury, huge problem, right? Like scary stuff. No one says hockey's terrible for your body because there's a risk of concussion. Right. I think you could apply this exact same argument to a ton of different sports, basically every single sport out there, except for darts and chess, probably. Yeah. Even those have a risk for injury. You could fall off your chair. Yeah. It could break out into a fight. <laughs> yeah. Never get a couple of pops going during yeah. the dark game. Game over. <laughs> Dart in the side of your head. Anything can <laughs> Anything happen. Can happen. Anything but happen. seriously, yeah, don't agree with that argument. Yeah, it's just, um, it's, again, coming from a point of ignorance or some sort of bias in, that has turned into a personal vendetta against a training methodology in sport really yeah. is what it's come down to. And I think you have to separate the two things um, and then also weigh the cost benefit factor for each one CrossFit as a training methodology and what it is constantly varied functional fitness performed at a high intensity across broad time and modal domains. That's the definition. And that's a methodology of CrossFit training. Mm. There's nothing, nothing dangerous in that. No. Um, you add in sport and competition to anything, your risk of injury can increase. It's like any other sport. Once, once you turn in, once it gets more competitive, your chances of hurting yourself are going to increase. That doesn't make a training methodology unsafe. No. Um, I, th I think I understand where the argument comes from. I don't think it's a problem with CrossFit, though. It's a separate problem. So I'll tell you what I mean. I think the argument comes from if individuals have either under development of some particular skills, whether that be weightlifting, some of the gymnastics, or they have some very obvious and pretty significant um, imbalances or I guess inefficiency in movement patterns. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that's not a problem with CrossFit. The problem is if, these individuals aren't taught beforehand how to properly and safely do these things, how to properly and safely move. That's where the problem comes from. So it's not a problem with CrossFit itself, with the methodology. It would be from um, a failure of coaches or gyms to actually reinforce these principles, which are actually principles of CrossFit to teach these things and enforce these things beforehand. Right. So it's a failure on their behalf. And then I think people see this and then they just generalize to, you know, CrossFit as a whole. I agree for sure. It's like giving somebody the keys to an 18 wheeler in London, Ontario. This person has no experience. Like, okay, drive to Toronto. Yep. It, something could go wrong. It might not, yep. <laughs> it might not, but it, it might at the same time, any generalization like that is it's, Again, it's taking what you want to hear and then blowing it up and completely blowing it out of proportion. The amount of lives that I've seen transformed in a positive way from CrossFit far outnumber the number of injuries that I've experienced or seen. And that's through competition and through coaching. And I've had one injury in CrossFit, one single injury. I cannot say the same for all the other sports that I played. No, or <laughs> can I? <laughs> I can't even list the number of injuries that I got from hockey, martial arts, um, soccer, road hockey. Oh God, yeah, right. That's like the worst. Uh, mini sticks, mini sticks for sure. Hotel hallways, just that going, stuff got going crazy. Aggressive, man, it's if we are constantly focused and nitpicking on. Um, the things that are so infrequent that it's not even a concern. It's, it, yeah. it's basically what's, what's happening here. Um, I think if anything, CrossFit in terms of total injuries, I, I 
bet you, and I, I haven't had a chance to read it, but Dr. CJ De Palma just shared something on Instagram. He's a guy that I work with with Wad Prep, and he's a physical a doctor That's physical right. therapy yeah, yeah. In, in Florida. Um, he, he reposted an article of a study on CrossFit, a long-term study. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm sure if he shared it, it's super legit. Um, but basically, from what I gathered – is if you look at CrossFit athletes on it on any level, the frequency of injuries in CrossFit compared to any other sport is much lower. Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's not a contact sport. You add contact into a sport, it instantly becomes more dangerous. Yep, um, especially from a head injury perspective. And you're never opposing another team or another individual. Right, it's individual. There's really no, there's no direct interaction with other players. No, so no, just barbell or whatever yeah. implement you're using in in your body. So yeah, it, it's just wrong again, right? It's like yeah. uh, kind of like everything else that we we can explain it in a hundred different ways why it's it's false. But I think we can really sum this one up in the fact that there's danger in everything that you do, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. And if we're gonna live yeah. your life worried about what could maybe happen That's no potentially, then you're, you're going to be living. pretty bored because, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could get dangerous. Just you yeah. lie in bed for too long and you get bed sores and a bad back. So <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> which, yeah, which I think just based on the current status of our society, I don't foresee this argument going away anytime soon. No, we, we kind of live in like a bubble boy generation. Yeah. This is a conversation that we will both have to have hundreds of times yes. in the next year for sure. And I mean, it's one that I welcome because it's something that people just need to be educated on. And just, it's not, I don't even think it's a matter of education. It's just a matter of perspective. It's like, are you really going to focus on that? Or are you going to focus on the fact that you're going to get stronger and more right, mobile yeah. and increase your motor control and performance and your libido is going to go mm -hmm. up and you're going to be able to eat. You're going to be focused on eating healthy to fuel your workouts and maybe you can reverse your pre-diabetes or reverse your type 2 diabetes, yeah. help with your heart disease, help with your confidence. Maybe you could focus on all these positive things <laughs> yeah. instead of like, oh, well, you might get hurt. It's like, come on, bro. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> give me a break. Uh, anyway, talking to the guy, it's like uh, he's got tennis elbow from doing too many bicep curls or something. It's like – your bodybuilding can cause you problems too. Your yeah. cross country can cause problems. I don't know. Everything. Let's focus on the good stuff, kids. Yep. It's a positive mindset. Yeah. Another one, cross it off. Boom. Dunzo. What else do we have left here? Do we want to talk about um, being bulky increases fatigue? Oh, yeah, that's another good one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this one was another Instagram submission. It was. Indeed. It was more uh, – I think it – I forget how it was phrased, to be honest. What I wrote yeah. down was fatigue due to muscle mass. So, so I don't it, know. Yeah. But I, I guess that could be interpreted in a few different ways. Like, yeah. Just like everyday fatigue? I wonder if that's what they meant. I think knowing this person, I think it was coming from more of a performance thing. Okay. Right. So like, uh, if somebody is 15% body fat, six foot tall and 220 pounds, that person just by default will become fatigued faster than someone who is not that same size, I guess. Okay. I think the, the problem with the whole idea is that it's a generalization and doesn't yeah, really, yeah. Can't really do that. Yeah, um, I agree. And there's like, th I think, with this one, especially, there's hundreds of different variables that you need to consider before you can even conclude something like that. Yeah. Like you mentioned a couple of them. Well, for one, like, what does bulky mean again? What is bulky? <laughs> yeah. But anyways, yeah, you just have to, again, so many var variables. Like, it would depend on the individual's, you know, body fat percentage. It would depend on, obviously, the amount of aerobic conditioning they do. But again, exactly. it's just, yeah, it's just like, it's just an unfair BS conclusion without actually considering all these different variables. Because mm -hmm. you could make the opposite argument easily 
if you're comparing, if you have these two individuals, let's just say that are the same height, but one of them is a lot thicker than the other than the other one. If you just look at them and say that dude on the right is way bulkier than that dude on the left, he must get tired faster. Well, you know, what's going on underneath what's actually in his engine. Like mm-hmm. maybe he has more lean muscle mass than the other guy. Right. He's probably not going to fatigue faster. Maybe he's better, you know, conditioned than the other individual. He's not going to fatigue faster. Like there's all these different things that you have to consider. Exactly. I think the, when I was thinking about it, I kind of, I came up with three extreme examples because I think this is a way to kind of separate things. Let's think about like a NFL lineman, a marathon runner, and then yeah. a CrossFit Games athlete. Let's let's pick one. Matt Frazier, the fittest okay. man He's on earth. Okay. Pretty pretty fit dude. Let's think about. I'm going to leave the training part aside and let's just talk about stature for a second. What's the most efficient way for those people to get their job done? And their job is performing the best of their ability in their sport. So linemen, it's going to be beneficial for them to be like seven foot tall and 400 pounds because they're bigger and they're going to be able to stop the other seven foot, 400 pound guy from getting to their quarterback who is significantly smaller than them. And they don't want him to get squished. That's his job. (laughs) If he's too small, he's not going to be very good at his job. He can be as strong as he wants. You're not going to be able to stop a seven foot tall, 400 pound man. When he wants to go from where he's at to past you, I'm not stopping him at six foot, and 200 pounds. Not going to happen. I'm going to be a flea. He's going to be like, shoot. I'm probably just going to step out inside. I might even just run the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. You, <laughs> you can have him. I'll see you later. Uh, we have the marathon runner. The most efficient way for that person to complete his work in the yeah. least amount of time is to be able to move, to have the least amount of body weight yep. so that he doesn't have to move as much weight across that crazy amount of distance. Right. And then somebody like Matt Frazier, he needs to be aerobically fit. He needs to be strong. He needs to have gymnastics capacity. He has to have all the different elements that make up a great CrossFit Games athlete. That's just like a physical stature thing. Um, But does that – is that lineman even concerned with being aerobically fit? Has he ever run a 5K in his life? I would – lean more towards no than yes, because it's not important for him and his sport and his job that he's getting paid to do. His job is usually between like two and 10 seconds for a play to transpire in the, in yeah. football for a play. Very short amount of time. He needs to be as strong as possible and as powerful as possible for that amount of time. Their endurance athlete, I don't imagine he's spending a whole lot of time trying to increase his absolute strength numbers in back squat, deadlift, bench press, yeah. a powerlifting type movement. I don't imagine that's super important to him in terms of overall performance. Is Are those movements implemented in his training routine? I hope so because they're great functional movements to just make yeah. sure your joints are healthy and you're strong and all that good stuff. But it's not going to be a priority for him. Whereas – um, Matt Frazier, his training is going to include everything possible so that he's ready for everything. So my question is, are these people that have all this muscle mass that you're concerned about fatiguing faster, do they, are they actually concerned with fatiguing faster? Do yeah. they actually care about it? Because if you're looking at the lineman and you're like, oh, well, he's big and he fatigues really fast when we're running. It's like, yeah, no shit. Because <laughs> he doesn't train to run far. If you train to run far, you might do a little bit better, right? It's like, <laughs> it's a ridiculous argument to even yeah. try to make. And then you take a marathon runner. And it's like, oh, well, he wasn't even close to this lineman's deadlift. It's like, no shit. <laughs> he's half, maybe a, a half, if he's lucky, of the size of this yeah. monstrous human. And he's never trained for absolute strength in his life because it's not important to his sport. So it, it doesn't make any sense to try to compare those two things. And then what do you got? Yeah, no, but I do like, so if you actually were to say pit two of these athletes against one another and say, again, that guy, just beforehand you pick, that guy would fatigue faster than the other guy because he's big and bulky, huge compared to the other guy. I I actually like the comparison of you take like a, take like a triathlete or something like that, who 
as you just explained, would have this, you know, typical stereotypical body shape based on just what we know it to be physiologically advantageous. They don't want to carry around this extra bulk for hours on end a day. Right. And then you compare that to, and you can actually like race them side by side, compare that to someone like Matt Frazier. I like this comparison because this is a perfect example of how, well, for one, this myth is just completely false. And two, you actually have to look into the finer details. So like when some of these athletes like Frazier actually in their training do like a triathlon or a a half marathon or something like this, their times are ridiculous. Like they they do, they are, they're comparable to these other individuals who are hundred times less quote unquote bulky. That's right. So, I mean, bottom line is you just cannot make that assumption just based on that right there. Mm -hmm. And if if we're talking about like a fatigue from an energy standpoint, like where's your metabolism occur? Yep muscles right yeah. like you need the muscle you need muscle mass in order to have yeah. your basic functions occur so i mean just from like an anatomical sort of a physiological yeah perspective on that like you have to have muscle mass in order to produce energy for your body so mm-hmm. it's kind of a crazy thought that like um you, you can't have muscle to be, to have endurance right, or, yeah. or to be able to combat fatigue through mm. exercise or competition, whatever you're doing. And yeah, I mean, your example with Matt, like I, I've seen those numbers and I've seen the numbers from like Jacob Hepner is another guy who likes to post a lot of his scores on yeah, different endurance sort of tests. And you compare that to the best of the best. And it's like, they're not, they're not beating the best of the best from like a marathon or a triathlon, but they're, they're comparable. They're, oh yeah, and they're, be, the they're beating scary. a huge majority. Yeah, 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 and I mean they're not. Yeah, they're not built like. Uh, and they're probably carrying an extra forty pounds at least. Yeah, so, yeah. So that that's uh. Yeah. So how about um. Maybe maybe one of the reasons why. Someone running a race against a runner or in a triathlon, one of the reasons why they can't keep up is because they accumulate all this lactic acid. (laughs) Is that right? Uh, (laughs) You you can start on this one. (laughs) Okay. So no, that's not a reason. See what I did there? (laughs) The old switcheroo on you. Yeah. (laughs) Just this saying. So this one is, a lot of these other ones we talked about can produce a lot of harm. Like these, these false claims, whether it be to some of the things we talked about regarding body image, things like that, Mm -hmm. these false claims can produce harm. I think this one at least is pretty harmless. Yeah, I would agree, but still pretty popular. So the idea of lactic acid, being the reason for that burning fatigue while you exercise or lactic acid buildup being the reason for that muscle soreness the next day, that pain that you experience afterwards, like the delayed onset muscle soreness, that type of thing. This is really commonly misused. So lactate is produced as a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. So when you are, when you are exercising at these high intensities, yes, you are, creating lactate as a byproduct. Hold on. Can I, what's the difference between lactate and lactic acid? Oh, so it's just what it's, it's the exact same thing. Okay. Sorry. I just, just without, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure that just clear that up. Everyone's yeah. fallen. Yeah. So I'll try and just stick to lactate from now on. Yeah. So I mean the same thing. Yeah. So lactate produced as a byproduct and as lactate's being produced, yes, you are, just coincidentally going to also be experiencing um, the muscle fatigue, the muscle burn and some of that pain. So this is where the confusion first came from was because researchers actually went into the muscle. They looked at these byproducts during exercise training and they said, Oh look, lactate's going way up. Well, that must be the reason for this soreness and pain and fatigue. But it's just happening at the same time. That doesn't mean that it's causing it. So fast forward many years, many more studies. 
We now know that lactate is actually reused. So it's shunted away into glycolysis, which ultimately leads to additional energy to then continue to fuel your training. So this means that you actually want lactate. Lactate is a good thing. It's a hell of an energy source for you during this exercise training. And then again, fast forward a few years, fast forward through many more studies. Scientists now know that during exercise, one of the causes for this actual burning sensation that we feel, this pain that we feel, one is an accumulation of hydrogen ions in the muscle. So this produces that sensation. You do have a change in pH, so you'll have um, an increase in acidity in the muscle. So this is another thing. And I think this is another thing that makes lactic acid um, a convincing term because it is increase in acidity that's associated with this, but it's not this. It's not the lactate that's right. part of that. And then if you look at that delayed muscle soreness, the actual pain that you feel the next day, we'll often hear people say, go jump on the bike, flush that lactic acid out. Again, not much merit to this claim mm -hmm. because at that point, the soreness and the pain that you feel is just due to an accumulation of inflammatory molecules in your muscle. So these inflammatory molecules that were created during exercise, ones like um, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, these types of markers that are released by immune cells during exercise training, these inflammatory markers, they'll hang around for a little bit. And then ultimately they send signals to your brain, which you sense as pain. A couple other signals, <clears throat> that are the source of this pain would just be increase in reactive oxygen species. So again, another thing that you create during this exercise training at these higher intensities, this is leading to pain. There's probably a whole host of other factors that are involved in this that we don't know about yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we, kind of talk about that the different modalities again that we discussed a little bit in I think that was two weeks ago kind of like the different hormonal responses right. there's probably all these different forms of exercise training that have like a little bit different of a response in terms of these markers that are producing the pain and soreness so like depending on you know the particular wad the particular intensity there's probably like slightly different um signals or like higher or lower levels of some of the signals I talked about that are leading to this, but ultimately not lactate, not <clears throat> lactic acid. Yeah. It's actually so, a fuel source for your body. Yeah. So which is something you that, want it. Yeah. 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 It's preferred over even sugars because even from like a molecular level, like yeah. a sugar is six carbons pyruvate, which is correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, like the byproduct of, so yeah. lactate itself is like a pyruvate with a hydrogen attached to it. I think so. Yeah. So, and that's only three carbons. So it's even easier for the body to, to use that. Yeah. And the pyruvate will eat up those hydrogen. Yeah. That are causing that burning sensation. Yeah. It's so cool. And then as you breathe in the oxygen that can connect or attach to the hydrogen and then make right. water. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but with the whole flushing out thing the next day, do yeah. that after you're done training. <laughs> yeah. Then you can get your aerobic system in That's there. Right. Yeah. Get that oxygen into the muscle. Yeah. And then you can start doing something with those hydrogen ions instead yes. of just letting them chill in your body. Yeah. Get so, yourself moving to get those things out. Point. That's a good point. Yeah. That's something we're not, we're not disproving that because that's definitely legit like if yeah. you if you next day's too late yeah if you do some aerobic activity immediately after a training session hells yeah you're gonna feel better afterwards yeah it's interesting even sometimes i find that if my like if a major muscle group like my biceps or something are super sore like one or two days later two days later especially i find that you wake up in the morning they're super sore you think oh like i there's no way i can use these muscle groups today. Like there's no way I can go do a bunch of pull-ups. My arms are so sore. Mm -hmm. I find that even if you 
go do like a strength training session that focuses on that muscle group within like an hour or two afterwards, that soreness is gone. Yeah. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. You just got to use it again. Don't, yeah. Don't shy away from it. Don't yep. shy away from muscle soreness because no. as you were explaining, there's so many yeah. reasons that it could be. And so many that we just don't know about yet. That's yeah. like, if you try to worry about what it is and just, recovery from a standpoint of rest like oh, it's man. not it's not gonna work you got recovery move. is just so cool to me <laughs> yeah I love that shit. lactate is uh there's some fascinating stuff on lactate in the brain too like after traumatic brain injury they've done i don't know if i've already mentioned this in a podcast before but there's some studies where they infuse so like after a head injury they'll infuse lactate or glucose mm -hmm. and then they can trace the uptake of either one of these molecules into the brain and they find that after a head injury the brain will actually choose lactate over glucose which is wild like when they're it's both crazy. when they're both present it'll choose lactate over glucose because they trace this molecule they see that it's taken up into the brain and the glucose is not so it's like it's just proving what's it's going preferred. on here yeah. like it's which is crazy so that's why um some people are playing around a little bit with, do you remember the supplement Cytomax? Yeah. 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 That was like one of the original carbohydrate supplements. Mm -hmm. So it has L-lactate in it. So some people are playing around with giving that post-concussion to see if it would help. Yeah. Interesting to see what comes of that. Yeah. Because By the sound of things, it's going to be yeah, a great it's, thing. Yeah, it's cool. Because it, you have, I don't really know... I don't know what the exact mechanism is in the brain for why it would choose lactate, but you have, there's not just neurons in the brain. Like that's all we ever hear about. It's just neurons, 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 but there's all these other different cell types that are extremely important, especially after injury. So two of those are my, my favorite. This is what my thesis was on. Yeah. Maybe we'll just have a podcast dedicated to that one time, but <laughs> yeah. they're called microglia. So these are the immune cells of your brain. And then another one are called astrocytes. So both of these cells are, they actually modify and to a certain extent actually control your neurons, which is pretty interesting because your neurons control everything. Yeah. But hey, they're actually being controlled by this other stuff. So it's like, it's like strippers or prostitutes having a pimp <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah, yeah. <laughs> might be i could come up with that one that was a good one yeah so these astrocytes i know there's something called um how's that go this lactate shuttle hypothesis where these astrocytes actually take up this lactate and then they are able to actually generate usable energy for those neurons. So that could be one of the reasons why this is so beneficial, but there, there's a lot going on there. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So just remember, remember pimps and strippers. <laughs> the importance of lactate. The brain is so simple. It's just <laughs> pimps and strippers. Is all it is. Yeah. That's all you need to know. Boats about. and hoes. I knew we could bring it up. <laughs> oh somehow. man, somehow that came back. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so lactic acid or lactate, those are the same thing, remember? Oh, is that what we were talking about? It's yeah. not something to be yes. afraid of, and it is not the cause of the burn. And no. you do not need to hop on the bike the day after because you're sore to get the lactic acid out of your body yes. because your body prefers it as a fuel right. source, and it's probably already used it. Hop on the bike, but yeah, it's for other reasons. Other reasons. Other reasons. Mm -hmm. What else we got? Oh man. Fasted cardio. Yeah. Well, let's debunk this one quickly. So same thing here. Don't fully know what the context of the question was here, but I think I would say there's a lot of misconceptions, misbeliefs about this one. I think the most, the context that we hear this most often presented in is fasted cardio will burn fat i think is what we hear it most often i think that's the idea yeah, yeah. since there's no other fuel yeah. in your body it's just so, automatically gonna burn your so fat. it's like that one's yes and no so 
depending again, it always depends. It, it really depends on what your body and brain is used to, what it's adapted to, what it's capable of. So if you are what they call fat adapted, so let's, let me just back up for a second here. So two primary fuel sources for exercise and for your brain and just for everyday function, really fats, carbohydrates, when you're exercising at a high intensity, you're going to be using carbohydrates. So kind of in general, you want to be able to match the fuel substrate with your intensity of exercise. So this means when you're at a high intensity, you want to be able to burn carbohydrates as in glucose or glycogen converted into glucose and then burn that. That's because the rate at which you can convert energy is much, much higher in carbohydrates. You can't burn fats at a fast enough rate to match a high level of intensity. So most people have no problem with that. They get to a high intensity, they burn sugar. That's fine. Most people are fully capable of doing that. But the other end of the spectrum, when you go down to a lower intensity, so just think, the majority of your day, like just walking around doing daily functions, you want to be able to burn fats. It's This is more efficient. You don't want to have to rely on the sugar. One reason being is because you can, you can only store something like something like 1200 calories worth of glucose. On the other hand, you can store anywhere from like 30,000 to 100,000 cows of fat. So just that comparison alone, you want to be able to tap into that second engine, we can call it. Or you, what I always say is you want to be like a hybrid engine. You want to be able to burn both of those. So this is called metabolic flexibility, being able to switch back and forth between those efficiently. So this would be desirable for athletes. You want to be able to switch back and forth. Otherwise, you're going to have to just constantly keep crushing the sugar right and obviously that has a lot of side effects <clears throat> so what were we talking about we were talking about fasted cardio yeah so if you have this metabolic flexibility in place then the fasted cardio could actually be beneficial because then you are you're able to actually switch to um using those fatty acids so theoretically you could maybe, you know, burn some body fat. I think that's kind of a separate issue in itself, whether or not, whether or not if you compare two groups, someone doing fasted cardio, someone eating before cardio, whether or not that first group burns more body fat, I think that's kind of debatable. Mm -hmm. But I think there's all these other factors that we need to consider when we talk about fasted cardio, like that could be beneficial. Right. So one is just being literally... By doing fasted cardio, you can teach your body to be more efficient at burning these fats. So just if we look separate from fat, it, fat burning, if you're more efficient at burning this, obviously that's going to improve your athletic performance because if you do, you know, anything, if you do like an interval, if you can switch back to burning fats during a rest period, then that's going to be advantageous. Um, and then in terms of overall health, a lot of chronic illness is characterized by poor metabolic flexibility. So people can't use sugar. And I mentioned this earlier, this is very common with, um, like neurodegenerative diseases or neurological issues is that the brain can't use sugar. Well, if you never taught your body how to burn fats because you're always you're always piling in the sugars the carbohydrates your body will just forget how to burn those fats and then it'll you know it'll just starve so you, that energy is not there so this is another one of those issues where there's so many different variables that you have to consider and you can't just say <clears throat> excuse me you can't just say you know, fasted cardio, great for fat loss or right. whatever. But I do, I mean, I guess just to kind of simplify and summarize, 
in my opinion, some fasted cardio, whether or not it burns fat, I don't care. That's a separate issue. I think just in terms of overall health, like it could be beneficial for everyone. Okay. Yeah. More from a side of developing that metabolic flexibility. Exactly. Over yeah. The concern about burning body fat. Only. Right. Yeah. Because I think that that is probably different for everyone. Like some people might burn more body fat that way and then other people might not, you know? It, yeah. That's it's the individual difference. Cool. So you said metabolic. So let's I don't think this is even on our list, but I'm curious oh. about um, the whole idea about metabolism um, and just the language yeah. associated with it. Yeah, I think it's um, it's something that I get, it's similar to lactic acid in the sense that I think the word is being used not in a malicious or in a, no ill intent by like using it and it's not doing right. any harm yeah. by using it. I think this one could be a little bit more harmful just from like a, a mental health standpoint, because if you're told that your metabolism is poor or whatever, however it's worded to you, that doesn't make any sense from like the science side of things. Yeah. You can develop a, almost an identity around it. So I'm just curious about your thoughts, like fast metabolism, slow metabolism, like what's, what's the, what's yeah, the deal this one's Let's just clear it up. I just, this one just to me really misleading because people say, people always say metabolism. And I think that they just assume that the only thing that means is basically the breakdown of calories, right? The breakdown of food. Yeah. I That's would, how people use it. I, I would agree with you for sure. And like how much body fat their body stores. Yeah. Like they have a slow metabolism. Right, they yeah. associate that with, Oh, well I store body fat because yeah. my metabolism is slow. So yeah. Yes. Metabolism does include, you know, just quote unquote, we'll call it burning calories, but there's so like, there's so many other things that metabolism could include. That's why it's misleading. Like metabolism is just metabolism is a cellular process, right? So it's not just the burning of calories that metabolism relates to. I mean, you have, you could, you could have, you know, metabolism of hormones, you could have metabolism of, you know, all these different, molecules going on in your body um i guess another example like we talked about a lot of these things in um so the fasting episode like we talked a little bit about these things like um autophagy which is like the cleanup of all this old cellular garbage that type mm -hmm. of thing processes like these include metabolism right. so it's it's i just it's just very vague and can be misleading again harmful but I guess just fun fact, something to keep in mind. Yeah. It's just, it's not used. The word metabolism is being used outside of its definition right, to describe yeah. something that is kind of related, but it's being used yeah. as like a blanket term that is associated with only the ability to burn calories or right. whether or not you're storing body fat or if you're lean or yeah. if you have a fast metabolism, Oh, you, you can eat whatever you want because you have a fast that's, metabolism. Well, yeah, that's that, where, where that, I hear yeah, that's often. like, that's the pet peeve there is where you hear like, your metabolism is slow or your, your metabolism must be super fast. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, it's just kind of, and again, it's frustrating just because it's wrong. Yeah. And so many people have been fed it that right. you say it without even thinking about it. And that then you just, again, it's a way to coddle yourself yeah. in, in a sense, right? Because for me, I'm on the end of like people on what you have a high metabolism, so you can eat whatever you want yes. and you look a certain way, whatever that is. And like to me, if I identified as that, it's like, oh, well, I'm just going to be skinny for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. And then somebody who is a little bit overweight currently and can very well change that if they do the right things in order to make that happen. Somebody says, oh, you just have a slow metabolism. Then it's like, oh, okay, here's my blankie. Yeah. I'm just going to wrap that yeah. around me and get nice and comfy that's because a good way to I can't it. do anything about it. I just have a slow metabolism. Yeah, it's like, that's oh, you're big boned. It. It's like. Get out of town with yeah. that nonsense. Get out of town. You're not big bone. That's yeah. a silly thing. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So I guess like I, ideally, like I would rather just hear people say something like something like your caloric metabolism or something like that, like your metabolism of macronutrients or something, you know? Yeah. 
or don't use it at all. Use it right. Yeah. Don't say it. <laughs> That's a pet peeve. It's like yeah. you can't because it does. It ends up doing harm. Not only yeah, physically, I guess. but mentally, it, yeah. can, it can do harm to somebody if they. Yeah, now that I think about it, like how often do you see a headline that says something like? Rev up your metabolism in six weeks Literally by eating everywhere. these specific foods. All over the place. Shut up. It's no. crazy. Yes. But people, you get, it's easy to believe that because it's something that is recognizable to you because it's used out of context so right. much. I really wanted you to cover that one. Sweet. I'm glad. I'm glad <laughs> we got into that. Yeah. What do we have left? We have, if it fits your macros. Oh, Yeah. I thought of another one a minute ago too, but it kind of slipped my memory. Probably for a good reason because, damn, this is long. Yeah. We can get. We're going to have to do a part two of this, I think. Yeah, I think so. We'll release this one. And we didn't see even, what other stuff we didn't we even talk to. about like the most popular one, which is protein fucks up your kidneys or messes up your liver or. Oh, yeah, too much protein. So I think we're going to have to maybe save that one. Yeah. We can get into the macros one quick. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. That's uh, just this idea of like the diet, if it fits your macros, can't stand it. Let's, for people wondering what it is, this is basically the idea that, so if you are tracking your macronutrients, so you're tracking your proteins consumed, your carbohydrates consumed, and your fats consumed, that's basically your primary focus. So your focus every single day is to just meet those exact numbers and the actual types of foods that you're consuming to hit that number don't matter. Is that accurate? Yep. That's uh okay. That, that would be the way it's done poorly. Yes. Yes. But yeah. the most convenient way to do it. Therefore the way that most people, if right. not educated properly could take that. Yeah. Route. But like, my biggest problem with this is that people people sincerely believe that there is no difference between a diet like this, if it fits your macros, where now if it fits your macros doesn't always mean you're eating like shit, but right. often it is associated <clears throat> with that. That's what my problem is. Yep. People sincerely believe that if you have this diet that is quote unquote crap but it fits your macros they sincerely believe that that is going to have the exact same effect on your body as a diet that's matched in macronutrients but composed of whole foods so that's my issue with it is that people they sincerely believe that there's going to be no difference yeah Let, which like is take absurd a, yeah take a minute to think about that and think about how crazy that actually is right, right? Like, that could be your carbohydrates come from candy only so it's all sugar yeah. sources or or cereals or things like of that nature your fats can come from potato chips and burgers burgers whatever your protein can come from protein shakes only yeah. protein bars whatever and eating that way if you hit the prescribed numbers right. for those three macronutrients, then you're going to be healthy. Right. Do we even need to go into why this one is bullshit? I mean, you guys are smarter than this. You don't believe this one. No. But yeah. but it's it's ridiculous. It can be done. It's like so, any other. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say another problem with this is that it can actually work. But by work, I mean you can actually drop some fat mass and drop some weight. Because if you're eating that shitty diet, but it's composed of 3,000 calories, and then you go to that shitty diet, but it's now composed of 2,600 calories, mm -hmm. well, yeah, like mm -hmm. if you go back to the calories in, calories out, you're going to drop some weight. And that's, that's where the problem stems from because people see this, they see, wow, you know, Todd lost 10 pounds on this if it fits your macros diet. It's the greatest mm -hmm. thing ever. Yeah. Humans can't be trusted with stuff, right? Because we'll find the most comfortable way possible to make something um, comfortable. Yeah. Right. We'll find, we'll find the easiest way to make something comfortable is what I was trying to say. Being uncomfortable is not the most glamorous thing oh, yeah. in the entire world. Yeah. So we should have a whole nother podcast about that being uncomfortable. 
Yeah. And the importance, I think that's a good topic actually. Relating it just to diet, you can take it with anything. You can take it with the ketogenic diet. You can take it with the paleo diet. You can take it with the whole foods, which isn't even a diet. That's just eating properly. So I'm not going to call it that. So eating food, (laughs) you could take that and, and do it in a weird way to make yourself comfortable and not have to change that much. But at the end of the day, uh, it's not going to help you out. No. Because things that can be learned from diet and exercise go a lot further than the physical side effects that you experience. Things like weight loss and performance, it's a lot more about your cognitive function and your right. ability to actually see things through and do things properly. Um, yeah. It's easy um, to be comfortable in that way. It's like, oh, well, uh, I'm going to follow this if it fits your macros diet. And now I have 150 grams of protein, 200 grams of carbs and 50 grams of fat. So I'm not going to eat all day because I want to go out for drinks with my friends at night. I've heard it. I've seen it happen. It's, it's a thing that people do. It's like, you can, it's, you can make it work in the worst health yeah, that's what I was trying possible. to say. Yeah. And uh, it's say. like, oh, well, I hit my numbers, so I'm fine. It's like, no, 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 yeah. no, no. Come on. Don't be silly. Yeah. It's a tough – It's diet is a, is a tough is a tough one um, for that reason. And that yeah. you can – if the uh, intention and the approach is not ideal, then you can just cause some serious yeah. damage. Yeah, that one we could, I mean, we could just jump right back to the, when we were talking about multivitamins, like if you just look at something like macronutrients, if you're getting your carbs, proteins, and fats from all these artificial foods, all these crap foods compared to whole foods, well, you're going to eventually become deficient in a whole whack of macronutrients. That's another problem with this is that you're not going to notice the side effects right away. Right. Might be a few years down the road, might be five, 10, even 20 years, but Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that covers. Yeah. I think. (laughs) Yeah. And that rule, those rules apply to all different methodologies around eating. If you're going to abuse it and Mm -hmm. make a complete mockery of it, just don't bother. Don't bother making it fancy and calling it something. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to do it, go for it, but just don't tell other people that it's good for you, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. That's a lot of myths. (laughs) Some myths or, well, I guess the most of the ones we covered were false. They were indeed yeah, they were indeed myths for the most part. Right. Um, a lot of good ones. Yeah. Could probably come up with a list of a hundred others. Yeah, I think this is definitely one that we can come back to right. down the road once uh, people are able to give this one a listen. Maybe spark some more ideas from everybody. Yep. I mean, I got a lot. Yeah, I'm already still. thinking of a few <laughs> others. Yeah. I mean, the biggest, the thing that I want people to take away from this specific episode is just to um, think on your own. Right? Yeah. Do the research yeah. for yourself. Think objectively. Yeah. Don't take what, don't even take what we're telling you right now as no. the truth. God, Please no. <laughs> take Please what we're saying. Do and not listen to me. <laughs> fact check everything. Um to be sure that you guys are making the best choice possible. Um, Again, we chose this list and kind of talked about them from a, a fact side and from what research and science shows at this point in time, as the research continues to um, evolve and more studies get done on all of these things that we talked about, there's going to be new things that come up, benefits and risks and limitations and all those things. So Mm -hmm. this This industry is not um, as completely established in the fact that like it's black and white. There's still a lot of things that are 
in the works and lots of things that we're discovering. There's lots of things that we don't know yet. Um, yeah. But if somebody like a lot of times in this episode, you probably heard both of us say it depends or I'm not sure yes. or things like that. Like we can't lie to you. If somebody's telling you a hundred percent that this is the way it is pretty much in anything, you got to be a little bit skeptical and just make sure that you're yeah checking. That's a good point for yourself. Yeah. I would, I totally agree with that. If you're ever wondering if something is BS, I think that's one of the first things you can look for is, are they, well, for one, are they saying that this is the be all end all? And then two, are they putting down or um, kind of demonizing like another method? Right. And I guess there's exceptions to that. Like we didn't really have nice things to say about if it fits your macros. Right. But I think <clears throat> we were fair in that we actually provided reasons why. And yeah. And we we're looking at it from a perspective of somebody abusing. Right. That. Yeah. If it fits your macros done properly and eating whole foods and sure. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's a great way to keep yourself on track right. and yeah. really be more of a conscious eater than a yeah. reactive eater. Um, the danger of it is more on a, a personal level for um, an individual that's following that methodology and abusing right. the system blatantly and then expecting yeah. results that aren't yeah. going to happen. So it's not more of a, not so much a problem of the methodology itself. It's more of a, a personal right. issue that needs to be resolved. We were talking <laughs> about this before this episode, how nutrition in particular is almost treated like a religion. Like people yeah. get emotional and heated about it, like mm -hmm. about specific diets and they will defend that to the end of the earth. So right. I Whether... think that's a perfect example of where you have to be, you have to think for yourself and look for those signs. Like, is this, are they forcing this one particular diet on you? Right. Like there's no one particular diet that's right for everyone. It just doesn't exist. Right. All right. Whew. That was a doozy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's it for that. Uh, if you guys want to have more of an influence on these episodes and the topics that we're going to be covering, you can follow us both on Instagram. Um, my Instagram handle is at Sheriff Academy and Chet's is at Brain Ignition underscore Chet. Yep. Um, we yeah. often post like questions in our stories as to what our current audience wants to hear about so that we are uh, talking about stuff that you guys actually care about because yeah. we have uh, things to talk about, but uh, not always 100% yeah. positive if you guys care. <laughs> if you don't care about the stuff we care about, then we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, any additional information, contact information – that type of thing, check the show notes. There's usually some additional details there. But our website, maybe particular offers that we have going on at the time, all sorts of things, so check that out. And remember, if you like this, give us a nice rating. Yeah. A comment, nice. five-star rating, that'd be nice. Helps us reach more people. And let us know if you like it. Yeah, I mean, that's the only reason why we're doing this is yep. to... We have stuff to say, and this is a platform for us to absolutely have a conversation about some cool stuff. All right. All right. Happy Halloween. That's all for today, guys. Hope you thoroughly enjoyed it. We definitely enjoyed putting it together. Send us your questions, comments, reviews about this one, and all other podcasts. Send us your requests for future podcasts. Again, we love hearing from you guys. That's really what keeps this going. And that's actually what motivates us to come up with these topics for different podcasts. So we couldn't do that without your input. Speaking of which, some episodes to look forward to in the coming weeks. Next week, we're going to touch on injury, recovery in sports, and fitness, really. How to deal with these in terms of physically, mentally, nutrition, supplementation, that type of thing. It sucks getting injured, so we're really going to dig into that. What can you actually do? And then the week after that, or two weeks after that, 
Our very first guest on the podcast, not going to tell you who it is. It's going to be a surprise, but we're pumped to have this individual on. You guys are going to love this one as well. Have a great week. 